thanks Laura and thanks everyone for um, for coming. So I'm going to talk about mainly about a ESOC different funded project we have um, around mobile training for community health workers in Kenya. So I'll talk a little bit about how I hope we're addressing some of the um, boundary issues, identifying and address, addressing them, um, and the methodology we've used to do that. So. Um, as I said, my name is Niall Winters. I'm from the London Knowledge Lab, which some of you may or may not have um, heard of. So it's essentially an interdisciplinary research lab that brings together um, educational researchers and computer scientists to look at technology in education. So, and my area is uh, international development and a little bit in medical education here in the UK. Um, so I had a look at the uh, website, you'd be glad to know, <laughs> before coming and uh, briefly looked at some of the, the previous talks. So I'll try and refer to those um, as I, <coughs> excuse me, um, as I um, go through my, my talk. But the, the quote I found quite interesting was to discuss the notion that ICT can be used to break down boundaries to learning and participation in um, society. So the ICT part I'm going to focus on is mobile technologies um, and the boundaries are going to focus on um, inequality because there are, there are many boundaries um, I could be talking about particularly in relation to this project um, and then finally I'll talk a little bit about learning um, as participation okay so I'll start with some some positive first some positives first um, how many people would have heard about mobile or the use of mobiles in sub-Saharan Africa? Two, three, four. okay, a few. So what do you usually think of <coughs> if I was to throw something out there? Mobile generally defined, okay, so it could be phones, it could be tablets, it could be laptops. Smile project. It's smile. Smile project, okay. It's the inquiry learning when you're focusing on, yeah? Okay. Anyone else? Even more broadly than in education. Um, I was involved in the um, a documentary about the in, in Kenya at mm -hmm. the time that they were setting up the mobile systems, and so it was fascinating for me because in the morning we would be filming in literally a mud hut, and then in the afternoon we would be dressed in all the white gear to be allowed into the mobile tracking station. Mm -hmm. cool mm -hmm. So it's an incredible diversity. Yeah, diversity, right? let's say. So you have, you know, um, <coughs> well, mainly I focus on, on Kenya, which I know is essentially a bit ahead of the game, but you have pretty decent um, 3G access. You have things like M-Pesa. Have people heard of M-Pesa? Mm -hmm. Money transfer. Um, one laptop per child is usually mentioned, but I can park that because that could be a whole other seminar. Um, and then just general numbers like, like these. So Africa been the second largest um, mobile market in the, in the world after China. Um, and pay sort of one of 150 <laughs> mobile finance uh, services. And I guess people have, place, have heard of places like the, the iHub. So these innovation labs that seek to bring together you know, public and private sector, essentially, in the development of technologies, usually in, in capital cities in, in sub-Saharan African countries. Um, another nice indication is IBM, for example, choosing Nairobi for a, for a research lab, which I think focusing on the emerging African market and this idea of moving towards the $25 is a bit low, but I think that's what Mozilla are looking at for smartphones. So now in Kenya, you can buy smartphones for about uh, 50 odd dollars. Okay, so the last one I was there, my taxi driver had one, for example, but six months previously, he didn't. So you can see a proliferation of these um, technologies. And there's lots of these sort of positive stories and there's a lot going, going on. Um, but then on the other hand, this goes to the inequality point, um, what kind of um, boundaries exist and how might we begin to um, address them. This is one of the areas in which we work. The photo at the top there is taken um, from AMREF, is a local NGO partner. We work with them, their health centre in Kibera, which is an informal settlement in um, Nairobi. But there's a lot of these projects ongoing. So this is one of the areas in which we work. And the other is a rural area in McQuenna County. So working with community healthcare workers in both settings. Um, interesting and interestingly enough, equality, one of the things is, is increasing. 
Um, but I think a lot of the focus is on it's increasing within countries. Okay, so it's within country inequality is increasing. So you have things like I pointed to in the last slide, continuing, rapid development, very good skills, um, technically uh, in country, but also purely, I think, for their um, rise in population numbers, um, still sub-Saharan Africa having 414 um, million people living in extreme poverty, as distinct from 205 million in 1981. Okay, so you can see there's definite um, divisions. This comes from a World Bank um, report. And then in Kibera itself, um, if you talk to AMREF, this is how they describe um, the Kibera informal settlement. So it's characterized by high levels of poverty, insecurity, and inadequate access to ba basic social services. Um, there's little or no access to water. Electricity... Um, Basic services and adequate san sanitation. Um, often six people living to a to a room, which may be the one the ones we visited were maybe the size of the space in between these desks. Um, some of them, and of course, this has associated uh, health effects. And you can go to literature and look at any number of these. Um, but one indication is um, <coughs> infant mortality um, at one hundred and fifty one per thousand as distinct from Nairobi generally, which is 62. So I kind of started with the positives because often when you get uh, people talking about sub-Saharan Africa or particular cities or uh, informal settlements like Kibera, this is all you ever hear about. <laughs> so there is a balance. I don't want to give an overtly negative picture, although the statistics um, are startling. But then you need to look at you know, what's going on locally to address this. Okay, and there's lots going on, but what we're focusing on is community health workers, and now as they're called in Kenya, community health volunteers, because they're unpaid. So these are usually female members of the local community, chosen by the local community to help essentially with outreach, base, outreach and basic and medical services. Okay. Um, and they, they do a lot. They do everything, you know, malaria outbreaks, TB outbreaks, HIV, HIV stigma, maternal and child health. Um, they work in a lot of, of different areas. And there's usually 50 of them supervised by one person that's known as a community health extension worker. In the Kenyan context, they can be trained specifically for that <coughs> role. Or um, they may be a nurse, for example, in a, in a health faculty, and they also take on the role of supervising community health workers. So the question that was raised, or that I raised in this um, project, is you've got all this interesting stuff going on in, in mobile, um, particularly in mobile health, not necessarily in mobile learning for healthcare training. So the intersection between, let's say, education and training and, and healthcare, there's less going on than there is in mobile health more generally. But there was generally this push to see what is the role of, um, the potential role of technology in addressing these kinds of health issues, or in this case, breaking down some of these boundaries to um, healthcare access. And that's what we're, we've been focusing on in the project for the last year or so. So it's going to run until June 2015. So I'll focus on some of the outputs first, and then I'll drill down into how we came about them. Um, so one of the key issues that um, community health workers are were interested in was in maternal and child health and particularly child development okay so how they can identify stages of child development and then um, look at the potential for um, learning disabilities particularly cognitive not so much physical and the support they need in doing so okay um, so the target was working with those community health workers working with children who are under five, and what kind of tools can be developed to support them in doing that. Okay, so there are, if, if we talk to some pediatricians, and there are tools available, but they're quite US and UK centric. Um, but the um, Liverpool School had done some work in Malawi on developing a protocol for understanding the stages of child development under five, which they call the Malawi Development Assessment Tool, or MDAT. So we built on that and built an app around that, that looks at, on a smartphone, a uh, low-end smartphone, um, that looks at um, 
how CHWs can use that can use that to help them re make referral decisions. Okay, so the app doesn't do the work for them; it helps them in addressing issues and understanding stages of child development and how and if they should make referral decisions. Okay, is that okay so far? So, um, and that's currently um, been evaluated or being used. Uh, we're about five months in at this stage. It's an iterative process, which I'll come to in a, in a second. So what does this actually actually mean? So text is a bit small, though. I don't know if you can, you can read it. So um, obviously, we've done some interviews, shadowing, etc., observation of, of what's going on. And this is one of the, the quotes from a community health worker, community health volunteer, as they're known now. Um, the members, this is the members of her cohort of, of Sorry, that she um, works with, the families or household she works with. We were eager to know the purpose of the phone and the application, but I was able to tell them it is good because the information will help us to know the development of a child. So they never had this before. Okay, So um, there was a lot of work around the training that also went around this, so I don't want to say it's in any way technocentric, but I can talk a bit more about that in detail um, in questions maybe. Um, It'll help us to know the development of the child, if the child is growing well, if the child is able to do this, the phone is assisting us to know the steps. Um, when the child is of a particular age, we're able to know if he she should be doing this and that. Okay, so that relates to the stages of child development, the kinds of things under five we should be doing at particular um, stages. So I think it's quite a nice, just a, quite a nice quote. We haven't only beginning to start the analysis of the data, so I just kind of pulled this one out. Um, so it's interesting to have the CHV perspective on the role of the mobile in their practice, so how technology gets embedded within the context of what's already, already happening. Um, okay, so that's going to focus very much in a, on an individual community health volunteer and what they're doing. What they're doing. Um, but now moving on to the more sort of education, if you like, with a capital E um, aspect of what we're doing in terms of designing this as a mobile learning um, intervention. So one of the key rationales, okay, was not only um, to look at how we can support practice or improve practice, look at changing practices due to the integration of mobile, um, it was also to look at supervision, okay, so um, as I said, there's community health extension workers and they supervise um, 50 or so community health volunteers. And if you look at the, the health research, there's tons of it <laughs> that talks about, kind of obviously, obviously you'd think, um, and as students, <laughs> PhD students particularly, can attest to this, you know, if you get good supervision, you'll probably end up doing a pretty good job. <laughs> is essentially what the research is 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 saying here and there's a number of, of and I've just highlighted and read there some of them um, good quality supervision is key regular supervision is is key and, and and support and also peer support okay which I think we'd all we'd all agree um, and systematic reviews pointing to this again to this idea idea of consistent supervision the idea of supporting peer learning and the role of feedback in that process so the app does all this, or it supports this, I should say. Um, without going into too much detail, this is what a community health worker works with. The create there is essentially the MDAT protocol I talked about earlier. So they use that to collect data on the stages of child development. Then there's a section of that where they agree with the outcome. So that will give a feedback of whether you should refer, whether you should not refer, whether you should come back in a couple of weeks or a couple of months. Um, and they can agree or disagree with that. And then they have to rationalize the decision they made in very short um, test. And that's all fed back to their, their supervisor, their CHU. And the supervisor can see that, can see the data they've collected. So they have sort of another insight into practice, into what's going on, which they didn't have before. Um, and then they feed back through the app um, to the community health worker. And then the community health worker can use that um, because they meet as an augmentation to what they do anyway. So they meet every month usually. And the problem was that um, they weren't getting much feedback. These sessions where they meet um, every month or so, lots of stuff can be, can be considered often pragmatic issues. So it's not necessarily focused on 
the continual developmental support of community health volunteers. And this frames that in a, in a, in a better way. Um, so they have content and they have resources here. So they'll get um, a little icon or a little notification at the top to say if when feedback arrives. Um, and the idea then for them is to have that extra level of support, usually from their supervisor. They can also engage in peer learning, let's say before they share the rationale for the decision they made about referral with their supervisor, they can do that, share that with, with peers. Okay, and they can have discussions around that. Um, at another level for this then, looking across a cohort, so the community health extension worker with the supervisor can look across their cohort and look at the information that's coming in. And we've done some simple work with visualization tools to visualize that information around you know, which community health workers are seeking help from, from whom, you know, who's the um, key hub, if you like, within, within, the, within the group, and they can visualize these um, issues. There is a, a question about, which we're seeing now, a question about the role of feedback and the nature of feedback and how they provide feedback, how structured that is. Um, so in that sense, the tool is also an interesting probe on practice, if you like. So it's given um, community health extension workers, but also NGOs more generally, an insight into the practice that's occurring and the types of learning or not that may be, may, or learning practices, I should say, that may or may not be, be happening. Okay, so um, how do we go about doing this? So how do we get to, to this stage? Um, just briefly, okay, um, and I can talk about any one of these aspects if, you'd, if you want me to um, later. It's a highly participatory project, okay? So we spent a lot of time um, shadowing, working with the community, understanding where the gaps were. The whole idea around child development was all driven by the community health workers themselves, some of them are, who are here, um, and also some of their supervisors with um, AMREF, the local NGO in, in Kenya. And they drove that, so they did not have the resource. They recognized that as child development is an issue, we need better training in that. So we linked up with the ministry, they provided extra training around um, understanding the MDAP protocol and how to, how to use it. Um, then we had lots of interviews, of course, um, throughout the project, both on practice and also on the use of the tools. So on the right there, that's Simon, a local researcher at, at AMREF working on the project. Um, and that's one of the community health extension workers in Mukwene, which is the rural context um, I mentioned earlier. So as you'd expect, lots of that, lots of work on photo elicitation, I'm sure you're all aware of. So we gave disposable cameras out to the community because we wanted them to speak really in detail about what they were doing. Okay, so often, you've probably found this yourselves, if you go and just ask people what they're talking about in their practice, they give you either an idealized viewpoint, or they'll tell you what you want to hear, or they'll just say, you know, yes and no, <laughs> depending. Whereas if you say, go out and take photos of your practice, bring them all together, and then talk around the issues, talk around the photos, you get a much richer view of what's going on. And you can use that to inform the development of your, of your learning tool, in our case, this mobile app we're developing. Um, there's lots of other stuff going on, but they're kind of three main areas in which we, which we worked and how we developed. So I want to come back now and think more towards the equality point I was making at the, at the beginning. So. Um, I guess um, lots of people talk or have talked about the digital divide and critiqued it and so on and so forth. Um, and I liked uh, this idea of information inequality because essentially it's what we're looking at, um, apart from what we're looking at with this, with this tool. We're not making any strong claim about <laughs> correlations between what we're doing and poverty and alleviation. Well, I can't really do that in a two-year time frame, but also, um, I think we're more interested in the learning practices and how people um, develop, how their capabilities develop, how they view what they do. So there's a theory-driven evaluation aspect to the project as well. So we're looking at kind of a, a theory of change that happens across um, the duration of the project based on 
the design and development of this um, intervention. But information um, inequality has been you know, characterized essentially in, in four ways. Um, the first is sort of lack of experience or lack of interest. So there's been research done on, on that, and that can be viewed in two ways. You know, one is kind of, you know, blame the poor, which there has been some done on, as in, you know, their capability, they're kind of marginalised or excluded. How could they engage in the kinds of tasks we want them to, to, to do? Um, traditionally, particularly in the early 2000s, probably late 90s, I guess, as well now, um, the traditional view was a lack of access to hardware. So we had lots of work done on telecenters, you know, providing technology to um, communities. And I guess that tradition or that idea has been extended into, into MOOCs. And now, Rebecca, you've talked much more in detail about this. But um, just my own personal perspective, I guess, I, you know, idealistically, a few, must be three or four years ago now, I guess, we ran a, a MOOC before MOOCs were kind of big. Um, with this idea of you provide resources and access um, to marginalised communities must be, you know, a good thing. Um, of course, it's far more complicated than that, and you find that, and I think a lot of the research has shown that it's people, you know, like us, <laughs> who are motivated learners who engage end up benefiting, you know, really the most. So that idea of just provision without something else, you know, isn't really going to work either. So that's an issue, and... The other is to look at digital, digital skills, which has often been formed of as thinking about things as life skills. So that's often, you know, data entry, how people get a job, that kind of, you know, new level e economic rationale to address inequality. Um, none of which we've addressed in this project because I've issues with all three of them. <laughs> but the last one is perhaps the most interesting, which is lack of significant usage opportunities, which is essentially... Um, how do people engage with technology in meaningful ways to address issues that are of a value to them? Okay. And this is where the learning is participation, I think, is quite interesting because you view usage not just as usage but as participation. Okay. So um, I'll just talk about Svara's quote there, right? Learning can be seen as a continual process of participation rather than discrete instances of, of acquisition. So there could be a whole other talk I could give on the role of mobile learning in development. So here, I think in this project, we've positioned it as participation, right? So how does this tool that we've developed help community health workers participate in um, the process of, in this case, of this one particular app, and there are others, um, of supporting and understanding um, developmental stages, child's developmental stages, okay? But they're participating from the beginning. They're participating in the design process. The issue is theirs. The ownership is theirs. The impairment is theirs. Um, and the learning happens around that. Okay? So it's really not the idea of a lot of mobile learning for development projects, which I've spoken for before, about put a pile of content on a phone, and because people have phones, they have access to information, and that's kind of how education is conceptualized, you know, which is a very weak understanding, even of what access is. Okay? So... That's a separate talk, but I think just to make that point about the link to, if I ran this backwards, hopefully I should be able to see how the methodologies or the methodology comes together, okay, in a participatory manner, to um, support the capacity development, if you like, of community health workers and their supervisors and the local NGO actually to address this issue of the inequalities that they see on the ground in places like Hiber and McQuinney. Okay, so that's what I'm pointing to, to there. So essentially, from the Swari paper, I think we probably all know, you know, it's more towards <laughs> the right hand of this, it's more towards the participation. There is obviously some element of acquisition because they do have the resources available on the, on the, on the phones that they can use, as and so they wish. So it's not totally saying, you know, there's none of this. It's just balance made much more towards the right of that um, table. Okay, so I've already said that. Um, so go, the last point I'll make, I think the last point I'll make on, on inequality, because it goes towards the breaking boundaries point, is I think if we focus too much, and that's why I've talked a little bit about mobile learning as information dissemination, 
of those four characteristics of inequality that were identified. If you focus too much on the high level ones, you know, they're simply the information of dissemination. You say that these communities get a particular kind of learning experience, which to me isn't very rich. Okay, so structurally, you know, and people who have access to better tools, better resources, etc. So essentially, <laughs> you're increasing inequalities rather than reducing them. Okay, and there's been work done on that as well. But so I think structurally, we need to think, even from the beginning of what we're doing, about how what we're doing may increase structural inequality rather than decreasing it. Um, and I think that's particularly done by focusing on um, what was called this usage gap, what I've characterized here as learning is participation, um, by empowering, you know, some people just like that word, but let's say by empowering uh, people, okay? Um, and I guess the immediate next step is, if I'm to critique this work, there's lots of critiques I could make, right? Um, the one you always hear about participation is it's hugely resource intensive. Yeah, that's very true, it is. <laughs> And um, so we're working on developing of a generic platform, okay, that is, so part of the work is underpinned by Laura Lard's um, conversational framework. Um, so we've got educational ideals underpinning, I think I've talked about, something around collecting data, let's say, if you want to a better word, on your practice, been able to share that with peers and with supervisors, been able to reflect on that and receive feedback on it. There's also a uh, so therefore, there's also a fifth one, which is around intelligent support. So being able to analyze that data in new ways to understand what's going on, particularly across a cohort. Um, so what we're developing now is a generic tool that someone can sit at a desktop or a laptop and generate these kinds of mobile web applications. So these are one in, one, run in web browsers, they're not native apps, um, depending on the task they're doing. So if they've got something that's on HIV stigma, and their interest in having these in underpinnings, so collecting something on practice. Maybe I don't want any peer learning, but I'd like to embed some media and I'd like to have some reflection. The tool can, can do that. So we're, we're addressing, I guess, some of the um, focus on the educational issues um, that come up around these um, use of these technologies in context. Um, and we are looking for a new researcher on the project, so if anyone's finishing and looking for a job, you can talk to me later. Um, and last point I will make um, around the whole post-2015 and the sustainable development goals. I think this is a really nice um, example of the intersection between um, education and health. So this kind of cross-sectoral work that's talked a lot about in international development um, and where that can go rather than in siloed within health or within um, education. So I'll, I'll leave it there. I think I'm pretty much um, on time. Uh, so some contact details there, and thanks, everyone. <laughs>